welcome to the KBB Review Podcast. We're back, folks. This is episode one of season five. It is also the 100th official episode, taking out the 18 or so bonus ones we've done. So it's a big milestone for us, too. And what a season we have lined up for you. We're going to be looking at some big issues, some marketing advice, some industry big picture stuff, and some showroom design too. We'll also be launching the KBB Review Retail and Design Awards 2023 as well. Now, while the launch of Season 5 of the KBB Review podcast is pretty big news, I'm afraid it's probably been a bit buried beneath everything that's happening in the country. Boris was staying, then he was going, everyone was resigning, and now he's a caretaker. I got very lost trying to follow it all, if I'm honest. So much so that I have a worrying feeling that for about nine minutes on Thursday morning, I was Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. Still, back where I belong now, and we're kicking Season 5 off with a look at a really interesting topic that applies to pretty much everyone who sells kitchens, and that's showroom displays. The products you choose to display and how you display them are vital parts of any kitchen studio, but how do you make sure you choose the right ones? More importantly, how do you sign off on the best terms with the suppliers? What makes a good display deal? What are the red flags that make you walk away? How much space should the brand reasonably expect? And perhaps most relevant right now, do you carry on displaying products that aren't available? We're discussing all this and more with two very experienced retailers, Jim Gettings from JNS House of Design in Oxfordshire and Alex Gemman from Gainsborough Kitchens in Lincolnshire. But first... A huge thank you to our friends at Masterclass for being our Season 5 kitchen sponsor. As many of you will know, they are a proudly British manufacturer of quality kitchen furniture, offering an amazing range of unique products for over 45 years. To find out more about how you can become part of the Masterclass family, go to masterclasskitchens.co.uk forward slash hello hyphen studios. And we'll put that link in the description. Right, as promised, let's talk all about display deals with a couple of very experienced retailers. First up, we have Jim Gettings from JNS House of Design in Oxfordshire. Hello, Jim. Good afternoon. Hello there. And then we have Alex Gemman from Gainsborough Kitchens in, in well, in Gainsborough in Lincolnshire. Hello, Alex. Hello. Nice to be here. Thank you very much for coming. Now, let's start as always with a bit of background. Alex, give us the 10 second overview of Gainsborough Kitchens. Okay, Gainsborough Kitchens was set up in 1998. We're in rural Lincolnshire in the small town of Gainsborough. Uh, We have been trading now for 25 years next year. Uh, We do a combination of uh, Symphony Kitchens, Laura Ashley Kitchens, AEG, Neff. And we have a nice catchment area that includes Lincoln, Gainsborough, all the way up to Scunthorpe and Retford. A beautiful part of the world. Now, Jim, over to you. Tell us a little bit about JNS House of Design. Yeah, JNS House of Design established in 2011 after a sort of retirement and then came out of retirement again because I love the industry so much. We retail Balfour Kitchens and recently Alku, along with the leading brands like Smeg, AG. Mostly the work that we do is, is residential, but we're kitchens, bedrooms and bathrooms. But we also deal with a lot of people who are self-builders and developers. Jim, I'm going to be bold here and call you an industry veteran. How do you feel about that? <laughs> yeah, I'm getting on a bit now. I mean, um, I started in the industry in, in January of 1984, believe it or not. Wow. I mean, that's pretty much before they invented electricity or gas, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's when kitchens were boxes. <laughs> that's right. So, look, you're obviously, you're both very experienced, independent retailers. and You've both, I'm sure, had many negotiations about display deals in your time. Jim, let's start with you. When you're having conversations with suppliers and brands who, I guess, either want to get in your showroom or you want to get them in your showroom, what are you looking for at that initial stage? What's the basic checklist at the beginning? I mean, obviously, you're looking for a brand that's got some longevity in it. It's of the right type of quality with a broad breadth of, well, in particular for us, the fact that it can be manipulated both in its carcass sizes so it gives us a lot of flexibility to deliver a more bespoke option to our client once we've established that the brand has got those features then really it's looking at the types of finishes that they offer across that range and I have to say the two brands that we work with predominantly give us that degree of flexibility then that way then we can actually think about the design that we want to deliver for the client and make it special and individual. 
And what are you thinking about, you know, in terms of displaying it in the showroom? What's going through your head? Once you've established, I feel like the product itself is what you want to sell, what's going through your head in terms of the actual display? Yeah, it's it's a bit of a balance, Andrew, in so much as, you know, you're looking to create an impact, so you want something different. And sometimes something different isn't necessarily what you think you're going to sell. In principle, one of the biggest problems is you know, the size of your showroom. So, you know, if you've got a small showroom, like we have now, we've only got a relatively small showroom with three displays, but those displays have to work really hard. So you have to be quite creative in the types of, A, materials that you use, um, the colours that you're putting in there, uh, and then how you design the overall aesthetics of the uh, of the kitchen to make sure that when people come through the door, it catches their attention immediately. And to do that, it's quite tricky. We also like to mix materials so that when you're talking to a client who perhaps hasn't got quite the right budget for what they have in mind, you can show them that having a laminate door, for instance, over a lacquered door, there is very little difference in between the two. But unless you show them that in an environment where it's in a complete display, it's very difficult. They think you're trying to backpedal on them. So I think it's really important the way you get manufacturers that do the same color but in two different finishes, i.e. laminate and lacquered, um, that you get those combinations into your displays. Then that way you can show the client that there isn't any difference in terms of the aesthetics. And what about you, Alex? Do you could care with that? What's your basic display checklist? I wouldn't disagree with anything Jim said there. Uh, I think uh, most manufacturers have a, a decent portfolio of product. Uh, if we're just talking about the furniture itself, then, as I say, we do mostly Symphony and Laura Ashley, which is also part of Symphony. Uh, we find, although it's not a bespoke product, that there is sufficient in those ranges to cover everything that we could need. Uh, so we've got a supplier that we're happy with. What you put on display is, it's much more than just uh, the product itself. It's the relationship you have with that supplier uh, and what we're looking for. The product needs to be there. I say it is there, but we're looking for the support and the trust that and the partnership with that supplier to know that we're always going to be able to get it, particularly in this day and age, to know that they've got our backs on territory for that product, You know, to know that the backup service is there, the quality is there, the warranties are there for it. Uh, all those things are also important. And it's not just the furniture, it's the worktops. We have a combination of Corian, we have uh, Silestone, Decton, we have all those sort of mixtures through the showroom. But Every time we, we pick somebody who we want to display, we're picking them because we want that partnership with them. We want that relationship with them. We want to sell their product. They want us to sell their product. But we need to get that relationship going with them. I mean, that's absolutely key, isn't it? Jim, when, you're, when you've decided you want the product, it's absolutely right for you and your business. That's great. Then you've got to sit down with them and, and negotiate what that deal actually is with them. Are there red flags? Are there absolute no-nos that would make you walk away regardless of how good the product was? I suppose I'm thinking about demands over how much space they want in the showroom, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I think you tend to find that less with the kitchen manufacturers. It's more prevalent with the appliance manufacturers, which I have to say is a massive bone of contention for me, particularly when you've got a, a smaller showroom and your know, space is at a premium. It isn't always easy to give them exactly what they want. And I think that's just what I would call a bit of brand arrogance on their part. Because at the end of the day, if you're displaying the product, then you're displaying the products. Like we, our showroom focuses mainly on SMEG and AEG because they're flexible in their approach. You know, they want to have the product on display. They understand that the space has to work for us. We have to offer alternatives to clients and you know when you get the the, the likes of, of bsh who sort of want the complete showroom as, as near as damn it it's not viable but as i say you, do, you tend not to find that with the kitchen manufacturers you know we went soulless both of that in in the showroom this year during the lockdown actually and that made a big difference you know it's it's increased our purchasing power and just like alex says you know we've had a long-standing relationship with both of that through Bodhi, who you well know, Andrew. For us, it was knowing the character, knowing the brand, seeing the factory, 
and then being able to work with these people on projects where you want something different and then trying to satisfy that requirement. And what about the bathroom side of things? Is that similar to the kitchen side? Yeah, tricky. With the bathrooms, certain of the high brand manufacturers want a presence, which we've given them in, in in small part. But now there is a growing network of distributors who are offering exceptional deals, I think, and exceptional support, more so than the brand. So you're buying the brand through distribution, um, but in actual fact, getting better service and better deals. Right, that's interesting, isn't it? Are you seeing this as well, Alex? Is this a, is this a bone of contention for you, this idea that the brands can demand a certain level of space in that showroom? I've not found it. I've heard the uh, scare stories, and he, he, uh, Jim mentioned one manufacturer there that everybody was telling me they would come in and demand this, that, and the other, uh, and they didn't. I think they've got to be aware of who they're going into and what the competition is, and I do understand that it is a two-way relationship and, and the brand would want a certain level of loyalty because there's no point in just displaying one or two appliances, for instance, from a manufacturer. You're not going to do that brand justice. They could be going into another showroom locally that would do it justice. What you don't want is everybody to have the same product. So if you're going to put a product into a retailer, uh, I would think you would want that retailer to sell sufficient of that product to justify it, particularly if there's an investment on your part putting the displays in. And I'm sure you'll come to pricing down the line. Yeah. Um, so... You know, we we it would be a red flag if a manufacturer demanded a certain percentage of the showroom. By and large, they don't demand it, but or they haven't of me. But manufacturers have said, if you are giving a seventy percent of the showroom, your terms will be increased to this. A.g., for instance, do silver partnerships, bronze partnerships, gold partnerships, depending on your level of commitment. And I can understand that. Uh, but we've not really had that now. Uh, we do bathrooms as well. We, we, it's a very small part of our turnover. Um, we haven't found that so much in bathrooms, but we, we have got Vilroy and Bosch as a sort of exclusive in the area. Um, don't really find it a problem on bathrooms, but I say on kitchens, no, we've, we've not. They're pushing for more space, but they're not demanding it of us. Now, maybe that's changed over the years. They haven't made them of me yet, so I'm fine with that. It's interesting, isn't it? One of the um, things I've seen over the years in showrooms is there's a lot less stuff in them over the years. I mean, back back in the day, it was all about cramming as much stuff in as you can and as many sort of displays as you can, whereas yeah, it's, it's much more now about having you know, one or two just fantastic room sets and displays that sell the dream rather than selling individual products. And as that trend's gone on, I suspect the, the idea of having a percentage of the showroom or a percentage of uh, floor space has become much more of an issue. We're in a very old building, and actually it's very difficult to have big room settings. But even then, we've gone from 20 kitchen displays to 12. As the years have gone on, we've taken two out and put one bigger one for exactly what you're saying. We try and keep things in areas. So we, we have an area where the NEF appliances are. We have an area where the AG appliances are. I don't want to oversaturate it with too many brands because I do believe that there should be a loyalty both ways with all suppliers. Yeah, I would agree with that. We limit the amount of suppliers. I don't understand retailers that just keep jumping and jump about for, for various deals. You know, I'd much rather have a, a, a strong relationship with my supplier by limiting those suppliers and giving them as much business as I possibly can. I think that's a fair shake of the tail that way. And when you talk about red flags, I mean, yes, it, as I say, it would be a red flag if uh, they were trying to dictate to us, but we soon get around that. The other red flags for me when I'm talking to a supplier, I want to know where else they are. I want to know uh, if other people are getting better buying terms than I am, for instance. I mean, this is, as an independent retailer, this is a problem you get with some of the sheds, the, the, you know, the multiples. Are they buying the same product significantly cheaper, in which case I have no chance of price matching if I have to price match and things. We, we don't want product that's been devalued anywhere else. So we do try and find out who else has got them and, and you know, make sure that there's a – you can't get exclusive on the likes of Neff and AG. I understand that, but now we do want everybody in the area selling the same thing. If they're all going to be selling the same thing, then I'd be looking for something else to differentiate. Yeah, I think it's, diff I think it's difficult depending on which part of the country you're in. Obviously, in, 
in the Oxfordshire area, going down to the southeast in London, the chances of getting exclusivity of any description with an appliance manufacturer is probably pretty minimal, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. What you don't want is a budget kitchen supplier down the road selling the same yeah. cooker taps and NEF appliances that you want to sell. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Well, let, let, let's delve into the, the thorny issue of, of cost and pricing here. The issue that comes up time and again when you talk about displays with people is whether retailers should pay for them or not. I mean, that's the black and white question. So look, Jim, let's start with you. Where do you stand on that? Should retailers pay for the display? It's a funny one, Andrew. I come from a background where many years ago, the particularly the appliance manufacturers used to view it, not necessarily that you would get them for free, i.e. you would not pay, but they would be what they would classify as an on-stock item. So effectively, they owned them and you displayed them. And at the point of sale, when you sold them, you paid for them. But you paid for, for them with the proceeds of the sale of those particular items in order to then get on. I think that was a great system. It helped the retailer. It doesn't seem to me that it exists anymore. I think the kitchen manufacturers generally try and assist, certainly the brands that we're we're dealing with, have been very helpful in terms of refitting the showroom, um, looking at the deal, looking at the package, offsetting some of the cost against turnover, that sort of thing. You know, I accept that we're in a different world now than we were sort of, 30, 40 years ago, costs have escalated and it's difficult and the market's tight and you want to be sure that you're going to get some return from the retailer you're going to partnership with. But I do still think that there is opportunities to partner with retailers in a sensible fashion over finance. So is that a yes or a no? <laughs> is it, is, I, well, I, I, think, I, I think it's unrealistic to expect them to say they will do it for nothing. I think right. it's just unrealistic in today's market. So I suppose, I suppose, if it was a definitive answer, Andrew, it, 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 the answer would be no. And what about you, Alex? Yes or no? Oh, the answer is yes, but only for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I forgot about that, Alex. I meant me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been around long enough now. I mean, I've been doing this over thirty years now, but I do remember deals in the past. I've been in showrooms where displays have all come free of charge in the past. I've been in showrooms where We've had to pay for them uh, at a reduced rate. And I've been in showrooms where they've set targets. And if you hit the targets, you get money back from them. And that seems to be the the deal that's out there more than any yeah. others at the moment. I would agree with so that. It, well, it, it really does depend. Uh, the problem is if manufacturers are going to go out giving free stuff away, then lots of people will take advantage of that. And you will see the same product appearing in over showrooms just because it's free. I think we've all seen shops over the years that have suddenly switched to another brand because for whatever reason, you know, that other brand came in and said, kick this lot out and I'll put you a free showroom in and then sell our stuff. And it's it's not the right way to pick the right product for you. It's It's a way of getting a nice new showroom and then you decide afterwards whether that's what's actually sellable. The, the right way to do it is to find the product that you want, find the product that you can sell ongoing, and then negotiate the right price for it. It, it shouldn't really be free, but there are exceptions to that. I mean, if you've shown brand loyalty to someone for years and you've produced the figures, then there's absolutely no reason why a manufacturer shouldn't take that into consideration and, and do stuff for free. But if you're setting out and you've, you've not proved yourself, you've not proved that actually you like that brand, you want to sell that brand, then there's nothing worse than seeing somebody get set up with stuff for nothing who's not really any intention of still selling that stuff in two years' time. I suppose that's that's a good question, Jim, isn't it? That there are lots of brands knocking on your door all the time, I'm sure, making you lots of very nice offers to you know bump that brand and put that brand in that is part of the everyday work of a retailer i'm sure some of them must be very tempting mustn't they is it hard to you know, resist sometimes yeah yeah I, I mean it doesn't happen as often as you as you would think andrew sometimes newer brands coming to market are the slightly more aggressive ones that would want to try and find space in your showroom but then you know you're giving them space potentially at the behest of a strong partnership that 
you've established with your current suppliers. My personal opinion is you, I can't overestimate how important that is to build those strong relationships. You know, if I pick up the phone to one of our suppliers, things like sinks and taps, we predominantly work with two manufacturers, that's it. Now, you know, we'll get the odd request from a, from a customer who wants a specific sink and we'll go and get it and we'll find it. But, but in the main, we work with those. And the reason we, we limit the number of suppliers is if I pick that phone up and I go, listen, you're getting all of my business. I need your help. They'll react to that. If they're getting a small percentage of my business and I've got 10 different sink manufacturers and tap manufacturers in my showroom, why is it in their interest to support me? Why would you do that? I mean, one of the big issues I always had when I was running Miele Kitchens was that type of thing. People were trading on the Miele name but not producing the goods. You know, it has to be a partnership. You know, you have to, it's a two-way street. You know, it, it's got to be give and take, and you've got to look to establish long-term relationships with the manufacturers, I think. We probably sound like two very reasonable retailers here. <laughs> yeah, we, we probably do, don't we? Yeah. There's probably manufacturers reps sitting there listening to this thinking, I've been there and he's not like <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, exactly. I mean, one thing I will tell you is that if somebody rings me, I never not take a call from any manufacturer or anybody. I'll always talk to them, but not necessarily, you know, I'll say, look, it's not for me. You know, we've got long established but by, by all means, pl- please keep us on record. Give us a call again. Things change. Who knows? You know, we've, the last 10 years have been quite volatile for the kitchen industry with manufacturers going and going into receivership and then coming back out again or the products have, have lost their quality, et cetera, et cetera. There's an old expression, the man who spends all his time tending his garden never looks over the fence. And Jim's quite right. You've got to keep looking out there. You've got to see what's going on in the world, even if, you're not looking for new suppliers. It's important to go to the trade shows, the KBB show. It's important. Absolutely. To talk yeah, to I agree people. with you entirely, Alex. Yeah. This is about replacing one thing with another, you know, is that that's one part of this. But then I guess when new things come along, when new bits of technology, new products that you do, that aren't in there at all come along, and, you know, you've got to take a bit of a punt on it. You've got to give it some space in the showroom just because you think it's a really smart-looking thing. I'm thinking of 10 years ago, you know, boiling water taps weren't, you know, a thing. I'm thinking like the Bora-style extraction. These are all new things that have come along, new technologies. You know, at what point do you go, I just like that, I'm going to give that a go that's happened a couple of times recently uh, relatively small things but there's the kalo wine uh, cooler that yeah people in the worktops i saw that at not this kbb but the previous one and i just thought that's a nice idea it's not going to be a big seller but if we can sell a few of those a year it's something different if i put that on display that'll be nice same thing with the everyday safe that was at this year's show we'd committed to put one of those on the safe in a drawer basically it's a small thing but it, it felt like taking a punt on it it felt like put it on display and see what the interest is it's not a massive investment to put it on uh, so yeah things like that do come along and you do think yeah i'll give that a try yeah i would agree i would agree with alex on that you yeah, know we've done similar things if there's a piece of tech out there andrew that that you haven't seen from your current suppliers and there is space and it's not in massive conflict you know, the, the 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 technology from the appliance manufacturers moves on or has moved on leaps and bounds, I think, in the last sort of four or five years. And they're all sort of playing catch up with each other consistently. So, you know, you know for a fact that, you know, if you're dealing with a, a reputable appliance manufacturer and a new technology enters the market, you know that within a 12-month period, they'll have replicated that technology or something very similar or even better. Plus, I guess there is, there's always the consumer element here, isn't there? That they come in asking for something very specific. So have you got one of them there, ovens where the door disappears? I've seen them on the Bake Off yeah. kind of conversations as well, where, you know, if you're not, if they're coming in asking for it, at the end of the day, you're a retailer, you want to give them what they want. Well, we resisted NEF for years, uh, and then the amount of people that were coming and asked for the slide, slide and hide ovens, uh, in the end, we gave up, put one on, and, you know, that, that's the best-selling oven by far. We should have probably uh, put that on many years before we did, but it's a great example. But that's where putting it on display 
is not necessarily about the day-to-day, your side of the business. That's literally putting something in front of a consumer that they can grab hold of, that they recognise, they understand, and you know once it's there, you're going to sell it in bucket loads. Yes, and, and at the end of the day, we're all after selling the kitchen and the appliances are not, they're not an afterthought, don't get me wrong, but you want to sell the concept of the kitchen, the design of the kitchen, and then actually you want to get through the appliances as quickly as possible. So if something like that is sitting there selling itself for then that's great. I also think kitchens and bathrooms are the biggest purchase you make without actually trying it. Like if you're buying a car, you take it for a test drive. But I was, you know, if you watch consumers in showrooms, they'd sort of grab hold of the handle and give it a tug or whatever. They turn the tap and then they go, yeah, that's fine. I'll have that one. Yeah, yeah. And that's very, because it's, it's all pretty subjective, Andrew. You know, it's about people will come in and say, you know, my friend has told me such and such a thing. And your experience may be completely different. Now, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't poo-poo what their friend has told them. But all you can do is give them a balanced reply and say, well, look, you know, we supply, you know, hundreds of kitchens in our experience. That's not quite what we're seeing in the market sector, but it's your choice. Two words for you, teppanyaki grill. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 A product of the eight, of the 80s, Andrew, that was. Yeah. <laughs> they, were, they just came for like two years. Everybody had a teppanyaki grill in their, in their yeah. you know, display, and then suddenly they, they all disappeared again. Yeah, and, deep, and a deep fat fryer, Andrew. Don't forget that. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, look, uh, you, you mentioned it earlier, but... Yeah, there's obviously you, you you get your display in. You agree some terms and conditions there. You agree a price. You negotiate the cost, and you know then you, you sign on the dotted line. And that's that. But given the issues people have had with availability and supply at the moment across many brands, it's not you know not just one or two. What does that mean for products on display? And the terms and conditions you've signed up for. You know, at what point do you go? Hang on a minute. You know, I've got this on display. It's taken precious space in my showroom, but they, I can't sell them. There aren't any in the country for me to sell to people. Does that break the terms and conditions? What do you do? Do you do, do you keep that loyalty? Then what happens? I think the answer to that question, Andrew, is is as you've quite rightly said, they're not on their own. Were that a case for a individual supplier? then clearly I would say, yes, they have broken the contract and therefore they wouldn't have any rights to that space in my showroom. But I'm afraid that is not the case. A lot of the premium manufacturers out in that marketplace are struggling. It worries me, I have to say. You know, you have to start to question the viability of those businesses when you can't buy product of any description. And it, and it's the bane of our life currently in trying to get product out of these people you know um, Alex will probably back me up here you know when we originally you know a few years back before all of this started you know we would almost just in time processes so that you know you'd order the kitchen and you knew that that was the longer process then you'd order the appliances a couple of weeks before you were ready to go knowing that everything's here now when we take an order from the client we order the appliances day one because absolutely yeah. The chances of us getting them when we want them are going to be pretty remote. We've, we've ended up with, you know, with half an order in a warehouse because we need to take those appliances just in case Yeah, they sell them to someone else in the meantime. So it, it can be 12 weeks before we fit a kitchen, but we'll have an oven and a hob in stock the next day, and then we'll be waiting for microwave for six weeks after the kitchen's finished. Um, to answer your question about displays, if, if – you know, if we need to sell something off a display, we'll sell something off a display. Generally, manufacturers still have some product. It just might not be the product you wanted. So if, if we get a hole in a display, we'll stick anything in it and then we'll just keep selling them on if we need to. Yeah, I mean, it shows how times I was talking to a retailer at a, at a conference recently and uh, they were buying container loads of dishwashers because, and he bought 30, 30 dishwashers in a container now, I've never come across that before, but, you know, he said, he said we bought them about four or five months ago. He said, we've got six left. Well, So, yeah. you know, because he was selling them to other retailers that just couldn't get them. But I guess what I've got in my head is, right, and this probably ages me a bit as well, but you know that Monty Python sketch where the guy goes into the cheese shop <laughs> and he's listing all the different types of cheese and the, the, the cheese 
guy behind the counter is just going, no, we haven't got any of that. No, we haven't got any of that. Yeah. And he's listing every cheese you can imagine. Yeah. I just feel like if you've invested in displays, you've got a fantastic looking room set, but you've got to walk around with that client going, yeah, you can't get hold of them for love and money at the moment. No, we haven't got any of them either. No, we're going to have to find something different to that. Uh, it, it kind of d totally deflates the point of the display a little bit. We're, we're actually finding we're not really selling off the displays at the moment. We're when we're presenting a kitchen, we're having a look on uh, on the websites from the manufacturers. We're seeing what's available. Uh, we're uh, putting that into a PowerPoint, basically, and saying these are the appliances that we're recommending. Uh, we don't actually go around and show them and look at the appliances at all. We just we sell them what's available, and we say, if you don't make your mind up quickly, these might not be available either. And we, we just explain the situation to the customers and say we're struggling to get a majority of appliances. So we've based our recommendations on what we think is right for you, but also on availability. But you've got a deal going with to have them on display, though. Well, we assume that they're going to come back again. And if somebody does want something specific, we can't get it and it's on display. I'll sell them the display. We can only do it once. Uh, the deal... I don't find manufacturers are having a problem with this. I mean, most manufacturers are saying, look, you know, we're sorry we can't get this one. It's going to be a while. If you need to sell your display one off, we'll, we'll put a sort of cheaper model or something that we can get in there temporarily, and then we'll replace it when they're back online. There's not much point in having a display that you can't sell, and the manufacturers know that as well. You've just, again, because of the relationship we've got with people, they've got to trust that we'll put it back on again when it does come on. And if they can put an alternative on temporarily that they can get for the moment they're still happy they've got a presence i think i think there's a lot of a lot of parallels in the market sector currently andrew because if you if you take the car industry for instance you know you want to go and buy a car you've got no flipping chance at the minute you know <laughs> they're talking minimum six to eight months and i had a friend of mine who ordered a, a land rover discovery and two weeks before it was due to be delivered they said, oh, we've, we've decided we're not going to manufacture that particular model because we can't get hold of some of the components for it. And he'd waited nearly four and a half months for them to do it. So I'll be waiting a year for car now. I yeah. I don't think the appliances are on their own, Andrew. I think, you know, these are these are general market forces that, that these people can't control. But if you've got a good relationship, you, you can work your way through these things, as Alex is saying, and hopefully gain access to products that are there to, to satisfy customers. I completely concur with that. I think it's just difficult, isn't it, that you your showroom is your you know is your selling tool. It is your expression of what it is that you are you are capable of, of what you can do for your customers when they come in. That's the whole point of it, and to, to have some of that eroded by the fact that you've you've literally got to point in things and say we haven't got any of them at the moment. Whether that, whether no matter how much you know that's out of everybody's control or not, I think you know completely deflates the point of the display in the first place, and, and it just it just makes. Uh, you know that the adaptation that every retailer has to make because of that in their business. I mean, Alex has said he doesn't even sell off the display anymore. It sort of turns the whole business model upside down a little bit. Yeah, it does, and, and I think you've just got to adapt to whatever's happening in the market. You know, these are, these are exceptional times and un unusual circumstances. You've just got to muddle your way through, Alex, haven't you? Yeah, I think. It depends. There are specific appliances that do specific things. So you mentioned the Bora Hob and things like that. Yeah. There are things that somebody will see on display that they think, I want that. I want that specific hob because that does a specific thing. But for the most part, it's a more abstract sell. Uh, people don't look around the displays and say, I want that kitchen exactly how that is because how that is will not fit into their house. They're they're looking at the colours and the doors, but actually the design we do is bespoke to them. And, it, and it's turning a bit like that in appliances. The showroom is showing you the sort of things that we can do. And now we'll design yours. And it might be based on that door and it might be based on that worktop, which might be on another display completely. And it might be based on that sort of appliance. But actually the, the package is bespoke to the customer and it, it's not reflective of a specific display or in this case a specific oven if we can avoid no, no, I, I suppose it must it's that question of loyalty again isn't it i suppose because if you know there's other suppliers other brands knocking on the door going well we can we, we've got models that we can have you can fill that hole with products that are available then you know that temptation isn't it i, guess, I suppose it is that the poisoned apple of, of trying somebody new that you haven't tried before just to get past a short-term problem 
Yeah. Well, you lose the loyalty both ways if you do that because you, yeah. you've then got to go back to that first manufacturer if that's the better option for you, uh, and they might not want you back. Uh, they probably will because that time they'll be desperate. But it's such an interesting, sticky issue at the moment. Is a very short term issue, well, hopefully short term issue of how to deal with, with with displays. But it's also built around, as you say, a long term drawn out loyalty that you've had with brands as well, and you know the two way street that comes with that. It's so interesting. This which is why I wanted to talk about it today because it is such an interesting uh, perspective on short term and long term issues. But look. The clock's beating us, gents, but we could talk about this so much longer. But really interesting day-to-day area of, of, of shop floor business. It's great to get such an insight from both of you. So thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure, Andrew. Good to talk to you again. Absolute pleasure. Huge thanks to Jim Gettings and Alex Jenman there for a really interesting insight into their views on displays. For something so fundamental to a retail business, it's fascinating how even that has evolved and developed in the last couple of years as habits change so quickly. Really, really interesting. Once again, thank you to our Season 5 Kitchen sponsor, Masterclass, for their generous support. To find out more about how you can become part of the Masterclass family, go to masterclasskitchens.co.uk forward slash hello hyphen studios. We'll put that link in the description. See you next time.